At the limits of such a case, the primary role is played by the soul of man. The soul has the exclusive possibility of undergoing divination to acquire the power of the son, which derives from the father and which belongs to the entire human race. In John, we read the word of Christ, that they all may be as one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Here we confirm that man is not only the crown of creation, but he is also, at the same time, its consummation as a part of God himself. Man, Jesus, and the Father are one. Through the Son, the universe is united with man himself. Therefore, man is the center of all. The scientific definition of the anthropic principle informs us we see the universe as being what it is, because if it were different, we would not be here to observe it. In short, the universe exists and functions so that man might exist. If the universe could have another distribution of matter, other ways for the laws to function, other movements of the galaxies and the stars, then man would not exist. We are at the intelligible center of a universe where the galaxies extend towards the frontiers of the spiritual belt of the all, in relation only to us, to humans. The philosopher Anaxagoras holds the deep conviction that just as in the cosmic becoming, so also in the destiny of man, a higher intellect governs, whose fingerprint is our own intellect. This grounds his unshakable belief that there is an infinite moral order in the cosmos in which man must cohabit, for whenever he denies this, he denies his universal nature. Aristotle holds that behind the power of the human intellect, behind the logical, the logical conclusion, behind the human imagination, the senses and the soul's reason for being, there is the scientific demonstration which explains everything. Man, for Aristotle, is the ideal center of the whole, who, at the same time, is also cosmological, in other words, real. The manifestation and the essence of the whole constitute a privilege granted exclusively to human comprehension. The anthropocentric theories of Aristotle are based on the tendency of the soul to approach divinity, the deification of man himself. The armory of today's sciences, equipped with contemporary electronic telescopes and microscopes, with macroscopic and quantum theorems, with equations, land measurements, and networks of laws, extends towards the endless horizon of knowledge of the world. If researchers on the entire planet believe that we dwell in a universe that is theocratic and anthropocentric, in a universe whose lawfulness is based on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in a universe in which man is an imprint of the Son, extension of the Father, and bearer of the nature of the Holy Spirit, then the investigation into the structure of the cosmos, space and time, by means of computations and equations, is conducted not only to study the body of the universe, but especially its essence, the spirit from which it derives. This characterizes scientific investigation as an activity that promotes the redemption of the soul. The coming of Christ on Earth is not only a planetary phenomenon, the investigators of the heavens conceived of his becoming before he was even born from the movements of the heavenly bodies. The retinue of stars shining in Bethlehem was the sky's testimony as to the events on the planet Earth. The time and place that the Savior will come, the time he will be resurrected, his proceedings from the earthly to the heavenly domain, all these are written in the memory of the universe. That memory is decoded by the prophets, and they write of these events centuries before they occur. The Son exists before the Holy Spirit is born. He exists in the apocryphal thoughts of the prophets, which are connected to the software system of the function of the world. All people are connected to all things, for the sake of the absolute monad. Christ confesses to the Father, I in them, 
and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. The cohabitation of the human soul in the house of the soul of the world constitutes the greatest challenge to the scientific quest for the active identity of man. If man is indeed as described by Christ, if indeed man is as described by the theory of the anthropic principle, then the only thing that remains is for us to become aware of our identity, as in God's image. If we come from the source of light of the all and tend towards the same source, and we cohabit and coexist with the boundless world of the stars and the galaxies, then we fully become superhumans with limitless possibilities, which derive from the person of the Son and the sacrifice of the Father. Then the soul ceases to have the narrow sense that the simplistic religious conviction of today's man attempts to give it. Once in my youth, in a collection of my poetry, I wrote the following verse. Man and the universe are two universes, and one fits in the other. I wrote that not because I knew it, but because I felt it. Today, I hold the same view, not only because I feel it, but because I confirm it by means of the copious data provided by the science of astrophysics itself. I turn again to the strong anthropic principle in order to correlate the universe's purpose of existence with man dominant. This incredible theory is supported by science itself. The Earth is a planet which revolves around the Sun. The Sun, as a star, is one of 100 billion stars in a common galaxy, our galaxy, which itself is one of the approximately one trillion galaxies of the observable universe. According to the strong anthropic principle, which is accepted by the international scientific community, that entire universal construction exists so that we humans might exist. It is totally certain that our solar system exists and moves precisely as it does move for the sake of the existence of man. If the movements and proportions were just a bit different, it would be impossible for man to exist on the planet Earth. The same holds for our whole galaxy, since the previous generation of stars was indispensable to the creation of the heavier elements which complete the harmony of its proportions. However, the miracle of the proportions and symmetries of our galaxy pales in relation to the other galaxies that stretch throughout the observable universe and continue to do so for the sake of man and certainly to such a degree of precision that the surprise that comes with verifying this claim changes to awe. For example, if the electrical charge of the electron were even slightly greater or smaller, the stars could convert hydrogen and the sun carbon and oxygen so that they did not create the required explosions. To ensure that gravity does not collapse, the rhythm of expansion of the universe has been designated with such extreme precision as to always be at its critical pace. In quest of the existence of the perfect law in every manifestation of the microcosm and the macrocosm, we consistently conclude that the universe exists for the sake of man and that man exists for the sake of the universe. This relation of man and the universe is the basis for the view that man is not a simple thought of God, but that God placed him at the peak of creation because man is a part of God, enclosed within the monadic one. Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John tells us, Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Here, Jesus confirms that the Father, the Son, and man belong to the same monad, the One. And Jesus continues, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And here, Jesus declares that the imparting of the Holy Spirit from the Father to him and from him to man constitutes the connecting link for man to enter into the monad and know perfection through divination.